It's the 9th of February, 2024. New moon, lunar observance night. We did our alms round today and then at 4 p.m. had our Patty Mocha recitation. The bhikkhus did their Patty Mocha recitation and then the Summoners, the novices, did the recitation of their precepts, and our Anagarika did the recitation of his precepts. This is what we do every fortnight, every new moon and full moon. Then we do this recitation of precepts. So it's a uh, recollection meant to gladden the mind, and uh, and also a lot of these teachings are, that we're listening to during the winter retreat are meant to gladden the mind. This is called Dhamma Piti. So, and it's uh, really good to understand, to start to develop right view. And this, the theme of this winter retreat is back to the basics, Four Noble Truths, Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, there's all sorts of teachings out there, and it's very easy to get misled and go astray, so we have to be careful. And uh, just coming back to the suttas, and in the suttas themselves, the Buddha talks about when he's gone, how to judge certain teachings, or even when he was still alive, compare it to what we know of the suttas, compare it to what we know of the discipline, does it match up or not? And. Uh, I would say for us, even comparing it to what we know of Lung Par Cha's teachings, does it match up with his teachings as well? Because in my, it's my opinion that Lung Par Cha's teachings certainly match the suttas and the Vinaya, the Dhamma Vinaya, and that it really dovetails quite well, that Lung Par Cha's teachings fit quite well with the suttas, the Vinaya. So we do have to be careful, and it is good to know about these different qualities of heart that we're training and developing in ourselves. And this is part of the learning process. So uh, the seka is the one in training, but also that can be translated as the learner. And the aseka, the, the arhant, is the no more learner. There's uh, nothing left that they have to learn in order to stop suffering. But for us, we do have a lot to learn, all of us. So we've had, uh, the last couple of weeks have been open afternoons and uh, we did a five days of a crochet, crochet training, crochet workshop for anybody who was interested. And for, uh, this is a really good illustration of just how to learn, how to develop perseverance, because part of learning is frustration. Learning a new skill can and will lead to some frustration, and I think it's, it's a great analogy for practice. So with learning crochet, there's, uh, I was teaching the classes, and for myself as a teacher, it's a training in not giving up on people. So it's like, well, you didn't get it the first time. Get out! <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. It's, uh, okay, well, let's see what you're doing. Let's do it again, let's do it again, let's do it again. So, and I'm not gonna give up on the crochet students and we'll try to help them along until they can get it. And then for the students, for the people learning crochet, then there might be that sense of frustration, like it's, this seems impossible, this is way more difficult. I didn't sign up for this, I thought we were gonna do a fun arts and crafts activity and this is super difficult. But then you persevere and end up almost like magic, learning it and being able to start to develop the muscle memory in the hands to be able to work the crochet hook and actually make some good-looking squares and circles, and actually within three days, four days, five days, nearly everybody was, uh, so not, not everybody was there at the last 
couple of classes, but uh, people were improving. Everybody improved. And even on the very first day, we had an eight-year-old boy there with us, and uh, he was not able to get it until it was a three-hour class and it was only in the last five minutes that he finally got his single crochet going correctly and um, I was so happy for him because even though he's only eight years old he persevered and he didn't give up he could have run out crying or you know just uh, completely thrown in the towel and not not persevered but he decided to just keep trying keep going and there was that interest and for myself, I was willing to keep helping him and say, well, look, okay, let's pull back to that mistake and see what you did there. And, and then he, I showed him again and again and again, and then he was able to get it, and that's perseverance. So it's very much the same with the practice that we do develop the strength of our perseverance over time. And acknowledging that frustration is a very important part of learning process. But then if we actually are able to go through the frustration that is almost seems to be necessary to learn a new skill, so we're learning how to stop suffering, that could be frustrating. We thought we were following the noble full path. We thought we were able to practice right speech and then, oh, I slipped up again. Why do I keep falling into harsh speech? Why do I keep falling into divisive speech? Why do I keep falling into idle chatter? Why do I keep exaggerating? So just taking that one path factor of right speech, it can be frustrating. But if we're sincere, we have to get better. We will get better if we're sincere. If we're sincere at any type of training and we don't give up, we will get better. The only way we won't get better is if we just stop doing it and give up and don't do it anymore. So this is the same, this is the same for any skill. So cro training in something like crochet work can actually help us to see this is how we should be training our minds. And if we work hard enough at it, then we'll be able to create something quite beautiful and very useful as well. So have, when I thought of doing this crochet workshop, then I asked, various people who would be in, how many people would be interested. A number of people raised their hands. I asked the monastics, so would some of you be interested? A few people raised their hands. Lay community, a number of people raised their hands. So we can uh, use this and think, well, what if, what if me or somebody else, say uh, a very senior monk, what if they were to say, oh, who would volunteer for a class to end suffering? So uh, you want to, if somebody wants to do an ending of suffering workshop, who would raise their hand? Would, it, would anybody here raise it? Can I see a show of hands? Who wants to actually stop suffering? <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> do you really want to stop suffering? So uh, this trying to actually stop uh, Maybe, maybe uh, we want to keep suffering. So that's gonna be a problem if, uh, if we wanna actually fulfill the Buddha's teachings, which are the end of suffering. Nothing else, nothing other than that. It's in the uh, reflection on striving according to the qualities of Dhamma that we have on page 115 in our chanting book is, uh, you know, if you want to do what's good for the sake of others, strive for the goal with diligence. If you want to do what is good for the sake of yourself, strive for the goal with diligence. If you want to do what's good for the sake of both yourself and others, strive for the goal with diligence. Yeah. So this is a, that's a very strong statement you know, made by the Buddha, and that's from the suttas. So whenever we look at our intentions or our motivations to practice, we can compare it with things like that. Oh, is it in line with that? Oh, why are we practicing? What's our motivation? What's our intention? What's our underlying motivation to, to come to the practice? So then, say, uh, a number of people might show up to the Stop Suffering workshop and uh, the Stop Suffering class, and then 
So then the teacher would start by saying, okay, there are these four noble truths. There is the, uh, the there is suffering, sufferings to be understood. There is the cause of suffering, which is to be abandoned. There is the cessation of suffering, which is to be realized. There's the path leading to the cessation of suffering, which is to be cultivated and developed. What is this path leading to the cessation of suffering? It is right view, right thought or intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. So that's the, that's the beginning of the class. That's the, uh, the basic teaching. And so it's like, okay, well, so everybody just now go to it. Try to stop suffering. <laughs> So, uh, and then, but this is, unlike the crochet class, this is going to take years and possibly decades of daily classes. <laughs> and, uh, but if we persevere, then it will be the same. The, then uh, the Buddha gives this very strong analogy. It was in one of the readings that, uh, you know, see, the Buddha says, say there was someone who, was told, okay, come and be struck by a hundred spears. Strike this, get struck by a hundred spears in the morning. And then you're somehow still alive. Get struck by a hundred spears in the afternoon and get struck by a hundred spears in the evening. And you somehow survive that. And then you get struck by those 300 spears every day for a hundred years. If that was the if the agreement was that you would be struck by if by being struck by three hundred spears a day for a hundred years by that effort alone you would realize the four noble truths at the end of that hundred years you should do that that is a good deal and yet that's not necessary that kind of pain and torment is not necessary to realize the four noble truths. It's, it's just a matter of perseverance. It's a matter of just applying ourselves to it. And one of the problems with this is uh, there's a lot of bad habits we can develop along the way. So during the crochet class, there was uh, a number of people who developed this bad habit of putting the hook on the wrong side of the yarn. So you're supposed to yarn over the hook, but a number of people started yarning under the hook instead of yarning over so that the hook would go over first. And then it created this very, uh, it, it did look interesting, uh, but it was uh, something that was very, very difficult to work with. And you ended up having to spend a lot of time on each stitch. And it, it uh, ended up, it would end up not working out so well. You'd end up with something else other than uh, a piece of artwork, you'd end up with a, a tangled, a bit of a tangled mess. And so there are a lot of uh, uh, ways we can misunderstand the teaching and thus end up with a tangled mess. And so that's why it's always good to go back to the basics of this Four Noble Truths, Noble Eightfold Path, just desire, cause of suffering, you know, these basic origination of suffering, cessation of suffering, path, and checking in with that teaching. And, and we can apply that to ourselves by comparing our own experience with the Noble Eightfold Path and seeing where we might be slipping up, where we can do some course corrections and uh, not be too hard on ourselves, be very forgiving with ourselves, and then gently nudge ourselves back onto the path. So... Uh, or we might, there was a reading one day of the teaching about Lady Visaka asking the Buddha for eight favors where she can give various types of offerings to the monks who come to Savati. And the Buddha says, well, what Lady Visaka do you, what benefit do you see for yourself in asking for these eight favors of being able to offer various services, goods and services to the bhikkhus who come to Savati. And she says, well, when I recollect that 
you know, any bhikkhus who have come to Savati, surely they've received some of the goods and services organized by me. When I recollect that act of generosity and that virtue, my mind shall become glad. My mind will be gladdened by that. And that's pamoja. My mind will be gladdened by that. My mind having thus been gladdened, my body will become tranquil. When I become tranquil, I shall experience pleasure. And when I experience pleasure, my mind will reach samadhi. My mind will become collected and will become unified. The Buddha says, good, good. These are worthy recollections. So, okay, so that's a, that's a basic teaching. What is that teaching telling us? That these qualities like sukha, which is the pleasure, they're rooted in the mind. They're, they're coming from wholesome mental qualities, i.e. in this particular teaching, Lady Visaka recollecting virtue that she's done. So through the sila, through the recollection of virtue that we practice over a period of time, the mind can be gladdened by that. When the mind is gladdened, we become relaxed. We can relax because we've we know that we have done any we've done things that we don't regret so we can relax we can be at ease we can be at ease when we're at ease then we will experience happiness when the mind is happy the mind can start to really settle so these things are rooted in the mind first and then sensed in the body as well. The mind is the root. So let us not get mixed up and think that we need to have pleasure in the body in order to experience happiness in the mind. That's a misunderstanding. These things come from wholesome mental qualities, things like piti sukha. They come from wholesome, the wholesome mind, the pure heart, nowhere else. It's not from clearing out our chakras that we get them. It's not from doing certain types of qigong or yoga or breath work. That's not the pure mind. You might, we might experience sense pleasure doing those things. Yes. We might experience pleasurable bodily sensations. We might experience pleasure of the senses, but it's not going to be the blameless happiness that comes from the pure mind that Lady Visaka is talking about. So that's something that's very, very important to understand. If we don't understand that particular point, then we're going to go on some sort of wayward path and, and we're going to end up with a tangle, with a tangled mess. But these types of misunderstandings can lead to bad habits in the practice. And once these views become fixed, once we have fixed views or fixed perceptions like this about practice, you know, maybe we've read some sort of book that said that or something. Has, has We won't be able to find it anywhere in the suttas. We won't be able to find it anywhere in Lumpur Cha's teachings that you need to, uh, you need to be able to clear out all these things in the body in order to experience piti sukha in the mind. So uh, right away, just coming, trying to do a course correction. Okay, these things come from the pure mind recollecting virtue, and so on. This is training. So the word for learning, the learner is the seka, and the one who is, and then the act of learning is sika, uh, the training. We could say training, we could say learning. And the word training, I think, is, is quite important uh, when we come to Buddhist practice. When the mind and the heart starts to become trained in virtue. So you all recited the eight precepts this evening. However, we decide to train ourselves and however high we decide to set the bar for ourselves. So it's like Ajahn Sona gave a teaching once saying, aim high. Of course, we're comparing ourselves to the Buddha and the Arhants. And so that's aiming high. Of course, we're not going to reach that level, but it is good to aim high. When we aim really high, at least we'll, at least we're not aiming low. At least if we if we throw a ball in the air and we're aiming high, 
we may not be strong enough to throw the ball as high as we're aiming, but at least it's going to go up. So when we, when we train, when our mind is distracted or when difficulties arise, we're always going to drop to that whatever level we've truly trained ourselves at, um, whenever we have some sort of uh, health crisis arise for us or we have some sort of loss of relatives, our mind is going, or we have, you know, there's some external difficult circumstance that arises or some sort of really difficult circumstance that comes up in our relationships with friends or, or family or whatever, then our mind is actually going to drop to whatever level we've trained ourselves to. So those things are, those kind of things help us to see where we're at. And the training, specifically the training in virtue, how steadfast are we in it and what are our underlying intentions for the training? Is it to just you know, be able to do the bare minimum just to be able to live in the monastery or is that, or is there maybe a sense of fire for virtue, wanting to really cultivate goodness, really getting s super inspired, full of sadha, full of faith to develop the pure heart. Is that our intention for the training or what, what is our intention for training in the precepts? However firm and established we become in the precepts, then we're going to experience a blameless joy, pamoja, we're going to experience a blameless, blameless joy connected with that type of virtue. And to whatever level we decide to train ourselves, and I like the word, again, I like the word training because it does entail that it's going to be frustration, there's going to be learning, there's going to be mistakes. But if we persevere and we train in making an effort to look at and realize these Four Noble Truths and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path, if we really train in it, then whatever level we train ourselves to, then the sense of clarity, purity, and refreshment of heart is going to be proportional to that. You know, the sense of mindfulness and clear knowing and the sense of just daily refreshment, coolness and refreshment of heart coolness and refreshment of heart, which is rooted in the mind yet sensed in the body, that will arise in proportion to whatever level we train ourselves to. So this is desirable. This is something that we want. And just like doing a crochet class, we might want to make a bowl cover, but there's a whole set of skills we need to develop in order to get there, in order to be able to do that and to do it well. And however we decide to persevere, uh, however long we're willing to do it, if we're really able to commit and go for a long time and put in the 100, 200 plus hours that it might take to make a bowl cover out of crochet, however detailed we want to make it, we're willing to put in the time, we're willing to commit, we're willing to train, and the sense of accomplishment will arise in proportion to how much we're willing to put into it. So if we, if we give everything, if we give it our all, of course, what we, what we then receive is more than that even. When we really do something, we really get the results. That's come, uh, it's only natural that those things arise. When we really cultivate mindfulness, when we really cultivate clear comprehension, so when we really cultivate sati sampajanya, and we really put our heart into it, standing on the foundation of virtue, then we really will get the results, just like the suttas said they would arise. Coolness and refreshment of heart. And different people might experience different things in the course of practice. Again, this is the happiness, joy and happiness that's rooted in the wholesome mind yet sensed in the body. Cool waves of peace is how it will it be experienced. Some people might experience cool waves of peace 
like like a torrent rushing through the heart that's actually extremely pleasant. Some people might get their hair standing on end. Some people might uh, start bouncing up and down on their meditation cushion, seeing all these things happen. Yeah, some people might uh, start shaking their body back and forth a little bit like that. So uh, these, these things can happen, but it's rooted in the peaceful mind, rooted in the pure mind. So that uh, cultivation of virtue, it's only natural that it's going to have a really strong effect, especially when we truly train ourselves to the point that with that basis of kamatana, that basis of practice that we've been working with, just like if we train for a long time, making bowl covers and crochet, we're not going to be making mistakes anymore. At first, we're going to be making some mistakes. When you do a circle, you have to do one round counting. OK, I do a single, then a double, then a single, then a double. Oh, then the next round is single, single, double. Then the next round is single, 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 double, single, 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 double. You have to keep count. If you get even one stitch wrong, it doesn't turn out right. You have to pull back to the error. So that's training. That trains us to not make errors. And we can really apply that. We can really apply that in the meditation practice. Sometimes there, there are certain aspects of the training. For example, the training at Kanti Bharami in patient endurance. It might even just take getting older or just being at this for years before we start to get it. But again, it's that factor of not giving up. I just remember when I f first came here, I was so impatient for results. I remember doing walking meditation a couple hours on a midnight or after midnight tea on the Lunar Observance Day. And uh, what I was taking for my meditation object was, was like, uh, I think I was just saying to myself over and over again, when will, uh, when will samsara end? When will samsara end? When will samsara end? And just like the really, and my mind was very impatient and uh, like, just want to, just want to end it now, end it now, end it now. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Yeah. That would be like saying, I want a finished bull cover now. I want a finished bull cover now. I want a finished bull cover now. Uh, that's another 180 hours away. You need to <laughs> just keep doing one stitch at a time. But as we develop the strength of our perseverance, this will get better. It will get better. At least it's gotten better for me. <laughs> yeah. I can only uh, assume that, that it'll be the same for others. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's there's still a long way to go. But uh, I can speak from experience that it has gotten better. And that that comes from just saying, OK, I made a mistake there. I'm going to pick myself up, keep going. The, the word for uh, offense in the Padimokha is apati, literally means to fall over. And then you confess. You can, if I commit an offense and I confess it with one of the other bhikkhus, then it's like they're picking me back up. So it's the, it really is this experience of just falling over, getting picked up, falling over again, getting picked up. Or Tanajan Mahabua like to use the imagery of what the practice is, is you kind of, you get really inspired at first. So you start out running and you're running, ah, oh, Nibbana, and, and you're running and then you fall, fall flat on your face and then you get up again and you're crawling for a little while and then you get up and you're walking and stumbling and starting to get tired and then you fall on your face again and then you're being dragged through the gravel and all these cuts all over you and you get up again and you're crawling and then you're walking and then you're jogging and stumbling for a bit and and then that's just how it is. But you just don't stop moving forward, <laughs> whatever you do. So uh, whenever you fall down, you just get back up again and uh, keep going and you just dust yourself off and, and, uh, and you just keep going, keep going.
one of the things I find inspiring in the suttas is uh, like Venerable Ananda. So that a lot of these monks that you find in the suttas, monks and nuns, they, uh, they never let up with their practice, even when they got old. So Venerable Ananda, he is the, I believe he is the same age as the Buddha. And the Buddha passed away and Venerable Ananda wasn't an arhant yet. He hadn't yet finished his practice. And so then the story of Mahakasapa calling to convene the first council and codify the teachings, the Dhamma Vinaya. Of course, Ananda is the one with the photographic memory who's memorized all the suttas. And yet the rule is, oh, only arhants can attend. So uh, they're like, well, if Venerable Ananda can't go, how are we ever going to do this? So then the famous story of Venerable Ananda at the age of 80 or 81 saying, okay, I got to finish it now. And of course, he's, he knows all the teachings. Yeah, I believe he is uh, Sakadagami or something at that time, once returner. And uh, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to, uh, I know all the teachings, know what needs to be done. But he's, he's over 80. And I just keep, sometimes I would forget that when I re would read that story of Ananda, that he's actually over 80 when he made that final push and he decides to practice through the night. It's the day before they're gonna convene the first council and uh, striving through the night. And then at, uh, it's almost dawn and he's like, well, I guess the mind just isn't ripe yet. And he gives up and then the story of he's, as he decides he's gonna take a rest and as his head hits the pillow, he achieves our hardship. And so, uh, because he gave up, and Lopur Chao would tell the story that, oh, he, he gave up in that moment. But all those qualities were there. His mind was ripe, but it just needed that one factor of giving up. Or you have the other, if we're talking about these basic right view type things, you have the story of Venerable Anuruddha, who was the foremost disciple in the divine eye, could see countless past lives and of his, himself and see other realms of existence and uh, have unhindered knowledge of different galaxies. And, and uh, yet he couldn't break through to Arhantship, so he goes to Venerable Sariputta and he says, you know, I can, I have the divine eye. I can, you know, with my divine eye, I travel all through space and I can see all these different realms of existence and can see all these past lives. And yet I'm unable to break through to the final liberation from suffering. And then uh, Sariputta says something like that. It's been a while since I read this teaching, but uh, you know, your, your traveling through all these universes and different realms of existence, you know, that is, uh, that's restlessness in you. The thought, I can do this all with the divine eye, that is conceit in you. you know, and then the thought, you know, I, I'm not yet able to attain arhantship, you know, that is, uh, I mean, that might be the restlessness too. That's also ignorance. And Venerable Sariputta says, you know, if you, if you let go of those things, that will be good. And that gives him that push to uh, finish off his practice. So you get that sense, even though he had these amazing powers, the divine eye, the, uh, the, all these abilities, those mental factors of conceit, of restlessness, of ignorance, that's what he wasn't seeing. That thought, I can do this, I have these abilities. Well, that's the conceit right there. So that's a basic tenet of the Buddha's teachings. Looking at conceit, ignorance, or the in one of the readings, I, I read the these lists of dhammas from Venerable Sariputta, the three types of conceit, 
I am superior, I am equal, I am inferior. That taking a position in any of those ways is keeping, is keeping the engine of suffering going. So we all have this opportunity. Uh, each day we are partaking in the class to try to end suffering. And uh, I think uh, we're, all, we're all doing well. We're all in this together. And um, people here are more or less showing sincerity in this. So just keep persevering. Uh, if you have any doubts, uh, check with a senior monk. Uh, if you think uh, you have any doubts or think you might have gone down some wayward path or developed a bad habit in your practice, you know, check with somebody. Check with somebody who's, who's been walking the path for a while, who, who's knowledgeable. Um, check with Ajahn Seik. I'll translate for you. Um, yeah, if you have any uh, doubts about some of these things. So, uh, but uh, we're all in this together. So this is a path of training, a path of learning. And we're, uh, we're almost halfway through the winter retreat. So I just uh, want to encourage everybody to keep developing themselves. And uh, maybe uh, I noticed the, the talking has ramped up a little bit. So we could, uh, we don't have the noble silence signs up because I'm, I'm not really that into signs, but uh, but yeah, we could we could rein it in a little bit, and uh, even though positive, friendly, camaraderie type talking is certainly better than arguing and, as they say in the suttas, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, and certainly nobody's doing that, not that I've seen anyway, and um, maybe people are just behaving themselves when I walk by, but uh, but. Uh, just uh, starting to, we, we don't have so much time. You know, if we have only a little over a month and a half left in the retreat, there's not so much time to really go inward. And we do have our personal retreat periods where there is that opportunity as well. Um, but we do have an opportunity to, if we, if we feel that joyful inclination to want to connect and talk, we can actually go back to the breath. That's, a, uh, that's one tactic for learning how to keep the... Uh, the noble silence more more diligently, um, but don't worry if you uh, if you can't keep it don't or you see somebody who's just uh, becoming a chatty Cathy then uh, then don't worry it's as long as it's positive if it's negative you can you can tell them to be quiet but uh, <laughs> but uh, usually we don't go around shushing people here that's not 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 creating such a good feeling. Um, but uh, so if, if there is talking, hopefully it's positive. And if there's not talking and it feels very peaceful, that's even better. And uh, so to give encouragement in that, in that practice as well. And um, I think that's, uh, that's probably good for this evening. Um, we'll have, uh, this will be an optional Lunar Observance Night because we have the Saturday night program tomorrow. So, um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we will make this this evening optional for anybody who would like to keep practicing through the vigil. Other, otherwise, uh, those who would like to do so can uh, return to their dwelling places, practice on their own, or take a rest. And uh, tomorrow will be open except for the uh, uh, evening, Saturday night evening program. And after that, we'll uh, change to our uh, afternoon only practice schedule with the, the readings at uh, 6 p.m., just before the evening puja. So I think uh, it's probably good for this evening, and I'll leave it at that.